or served to um, probably better served if uh, we can to uh, go right into Aaron's remarks. And uh, if we get the chance, we can show the video perhaps later. Um, so for everybody, uh, without any further delay, what I'd love to do is turn it over to, to Aaron and go right into Aaron's remarks. And uh, if we get the chance, we can show the video perhaps later. Um, so for everybody, uh, without any further delay, what I'd love to do is turn it over to, to Aaron and go right into Aaron's remarks. And uh, if we get the chance, we can show the video. Hey, Eric, I'm hearing a, uh, an echo. Maybe, maybe we just close the video. No, it was, uh, we're having some technical difficulties. Give us two seconds. We're straightening them out. I apologize for the issues. Uh, I think we should okay. be good to go for Aaron if you want to begin speaking. Um, and then we can show the the video um, upon uh, okay. right after before we go to the questions and, and answers. Sounds Sorry good. About that, everyone. Je Jessica, can you hear me? Yes. Well, okay, Eric. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for joining our uh, uh, joining this briefing. It it was an honor uh, to to represent uh, our community. Uh, to represent cabinet and uh, of course uh, my co-chair Lindsey Glantz um, uh, from Broward uh, on this uh, on this fly in this mission. Uh, many people have asked why uh, why I why I went um, and and the simple uh, answer uh, and not to be flippant is um, I was asked. Uh, when you're asked, you you go. Um, I wanted to be the eyes and ears of our community. Uh, I, the week prior, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with the Ukrainian ambassador, Oksana Markorova, uh, who implored us to do uh, more and to push our government uh, to help her people. Uh, to be completely candid, I felt somewhat helpless and, and unsure uh, about the ask. Um, I, those who are with me, uh, I, I literally choked up when I said to her that we will do what we can to fulfill her request, um, knowing full well that I didn't, knowing full well that I didn't, um, I didn't know exactly um, what what would be in store. Um, so, in addition to donating, I felt like this is something that um, I had to do. I had an obligation. Um, the purpose. Of, of our trip was to, to really bear witness to the tragedy on the ground, to meet with families, hear their stories, and really to see the good work of the Jewish federations, the Jewish agency, and the Joint Distribution Committee. Um, and let me reiterate the life-saving work uh, of these organizations. Um, the reports on the ground are accurate, um, terrifying, but accurate. Uh, by any measure, we are witnessing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. There are over 10 million people displaced and over 3.5 million refugees that have fled Ukraine. Uh, and the most recent atrocities that we've seen are impossible to stomach or fathom, as, as we all know. There were many moments um, showing human tragedy of the war uh, the innocent fighting for survival, and the, the unbelievable network and work of, um, of angels, no doubt about it, of angels. There are three points in the mission that will forever haunt me and motivate me and hopefully others to do everything and anything that we can to help. One was in Warsaw. The other was in Lublin, and the last one was at one of the two main border crossings in Poland, Medica. In Warsaw, we met with representatives of one of our partner agencies, the Jewish Agency, at a hotel that had been converted into a refugee absorption center. 
This was a four-star hotel that had not been opened to the public that was converted into a center. There are several in Warsaw and throughout Poland. The representatives described the work on the ground to provide transportation, shelter, and food to thousands of displaced persons and refugees. I will always remember the phrase, first of all, you need to rest. First of all, you need to take a tea, a coffee. You are friends. Eugene Genia Lavrinov, a burly, bald Ukrainian worker, worker for the Jewish agency, described how he spent several nights communicating with the granddaughter, Mamila, of a woman that saved Jews during the Holocaust. We refer to them as righteous Gentiles. For hours at a time, Genia would check in with Mamila and her daughter as they made the treacherous journey from the eastern part of Ukraine to the border. Mamila didn't understand exactly who we were, why we were helping, how she was going to pay for any of the services that she was getting, how she would pay for food or shelter. And she repeatedly said, we are not Jewish. Why are you doing this? Genia responded by telling them that they are friends of Israel and to not worry and that nobody is going to be denied care. When they arrived in Warsaw, Genia put Mamilla and her daughter at ease, encouraging them to rest, drink tea, drink coffee. I have vivid memories of my grandmother offering guests tea, coffee, sweets to comfort them and make them feel at home. This was her trademark. And this is our trademark as a people to comfort those in need and make them feel at home. Mamila and her daughter were too exhausted and in shock to meet with us, and they were apologetic that they couldn't. But the story hit very close to home for me. I'm here today speaking with you because of the kindness of angels, nuns who sheltered my grandmother, Eva, in Bucharest, Romania. I will never know their names, what they look like, what motivated them, or what it must have felt like to put their own lives at risk for my grandmother's, a child at the time. Genia's accounting had me in tears because I felt a sense of obligation to do that which others have done for me and what my grandmother modeled. I didn't need to meet the family because I knew they were safe and well taken care of by our partner agencies that are funded by the Jewish Federations. I knew our work on the ground helped them get there and would serve as a safety net as they made Aliyah Aliyah to Israel. In Lublin, we stopped at Chaychmi Lublin Yeshiva, which was in the 1930s, the largest yeshiva in the world. It is now another hotel providing temporary accommodations for refugees. We met with several families to hear their harrowing stories. One mother shared the story of her and her daughter trying to find a shelter in Kiev and breaking into it, literally breaking the lock. She shared that for weeks, she and her 15-year-old daughter, Sophia, hid in this basement with many other families. She couldn't hold back her tears, clenching her daughter's hand as she recounted the dark days in unsanitary and crowded conditions. She told us there was no running water, no electricity. She said that if you go outside, you could be shot. She said no one is safe in the cities and no one knows whether or not they can go back home. This is right out of her mouth. The daughter, an aspiring painter, asked us if we wanted to see her art. We said yes. So she scurried out of the room and returned with a picture of an anime child holding a bear. She described the picture as expressing her emotions, her fears, her dreams, and her aspirations. She said to us with with a straight face that we should fulfill our dreams as well. 
candidly, I was, I was quite astonished how reflective she was. And I, I can't imagine what it would be like to grow up at, at 15 or if you ask Batya at 30. It, it's certainly, uh, for me, seeing her talk about her experiences, seeing the mother talk about hers, um, there, it, it was gut-wrenching. Um, and I was, I was quite surprised that the daughter was that strong um, to share her insights um, and to share something so special to her, uh, which was her heart. The third experience, we were on the border. Border is about, say, five and a half hours, six hours from Warsaw, due southeast. It's about 65 miles outside of Libya. That day, we were told it was slower than usual, with only a few hundred people coming through the border because the Ukrainian military held their ground in Kiev. I really couldn't imagine a busier day, to be honest, because it, it already felt crowded. Tents on each side of this long pathway to the buses where refugees would wait to be taken to shelters. Those tents represented multiple humanitarian organizations providing food, supplies, clothing, and other items. Representatives from our partner agencies, the Joint Distribution Committee and the Jewish Agency greeted people as they crossed the border gates and entered the country. Here's what we saw. We saw women and children walking through the border, the children holding tattered stuffed animals, multicolored backpacks. We saw elderly in wheelchairs waiting for assistance from one area to the next. We learned that for some, the travel was a couple of hours and others, weeks, literally weeks. They had small suitcases and bags with strollers and some had pets. Some were pushing their luggage in shopping carts, but the look on their faces of bewilderment, um, that, that will stay with me. It, it's, it's nothing I have ever seen. A mother with her children maintained her composure until she crossed the border and she broke. She couldn't stop weeping. And thankfully we had JDC representatives because the first tent, as you enter the border, as you enter Poland, is a JDC tent. We had representatives there to, to comfort her and to console her. I saw one family, and it was, a, it, it was by happenstance that one family was reunited. Um, the, the child was kind of smushed in between the two. You had the, it, it looked like either the husband or brother coming uh, one way towards the border, the, the sister, the, mother, the, the wife coming the other way, the child with her, and they locked. I haven't seen an embrace like that. It's nothing I've ever seen. Um, gave me chills, gave me goosebumps. Um, it made me miss Batya, my wife. It, uh, it's something that, I'll, that, that will stick with me. Um, and it's kind of the horror of, of what this war has created. I'll say that amongst the chaos and the darkness, we really did witness humanity at the best. We saw our partner agencies hard at work, turning buildings and turning hotels into shelters. When people say they don't know where our money is going, I saw it. There is infrastructure there because of us. And we have to thank God for it. I saw with my own two eyes 
the humanitarian efforts that we as a community nationally and abroad fund. I saw representatives guide refugees across the border and arrange transport and accommodations. I saw healthcare professionals comfort families. I spoke to individuals that operate hotlines to coordinate rescue efforts, literally on the ground in Ukraine, in different parts of the country, including in Maripol. I spoke to Israeli pediatricians that traveled to Poland to work with our partner agencies to care for medical needs of the Ukrainian children. I saw firsthand the efforts taken to find lodging, to find lodging and accommodations for refugees. So why, why am I, why are we, are we doing this? You, you'll hear a little bit more um, from Fred, from Eric and others. But there is going to be additional need, significant additional need, not only to get us through the current crisis, but also to rebuild. The anticipation is north of $100 million more in aid. It is important for all of us to understand what our obligations are. In one of the worst humanitarian crises um, in our lifetimes and since World War II, there is nothing more important, at least to, to me and I believe our organization, um, but to help those in need um, and to hopefully resettle uh, refugees here in the United States and, and especially in Nashville. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Aaron, so much for sharing your moving remarks and your firsthand experience, your account on our behalf to be our eyes and ears on the ground is of tremendous importance. So thank you very, very much. We have a robust group with us today, and I know we have lots of folks here who are uh, very concerned and very much interested in what you discussed, and they may have questions. So let's let's pause for a moment and give folks a chance to ask you, based on what you saw, what you experienced, questions that they might have, so that they can learn more about this this dire situation. So if folks want to ask questions, you can do so by putting it in the chat. I'm happy to moderate that. Uh, or if uh, we don't we don't have too large a group, you could take yourself off of mute and you could ask your question verbally. So let's give. We, we're also, Aaron has asked that we share some pictures of um, of what he saw. Michal, can you share some of those photos, please, to just show some of Aaron's personal pictures that he um, he took while he was there. And then Aaron, if you can give us a little background on each of these images, that would be great. Sure, Aaron just has to take himself off mute. This is the image of the, um, this is the image of the family that was reunited that I described, um, described earlier. Right, and this is right at the border. Should be some other pics as well. This is Sophia, kind of with as you as I described it, the the uh, anime. I think I said it right. I think it's anime. I'm not sure exactly. I think I'm too old for this. Sorry, um, but uh, the anime and then the and then uh, a stuffed animal or doll um, in her hand. Um, this this was in Lublin, um, and this was actually in the in the uh, the sanctuary. Um, where there were multiple families with her. Um, this is right on the border, kind of as, as described. You've got, you know, children in strollers, backpacks, kind of, and then all of these humanitarian tents. Um, I think this was the tent where 
the Sikhs were making soup. I eyed the soup a little bit. It smelled pretty good. Um, but uh, you can kind of see the folks in yellow jackets, um, many of which were representatives from, from the JDC. Um, this was, uh, I, she was adorable. I mean, this was in Lublin. Um, I, 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 it was, it was, uh, incredibly disheartening to see children of that age. Um, we just tried to, we gave them balloons and we gave them other stuff to make them, uh, to, to make them smile. Uh, we had one person on our trip that spoke Russian, uh, which was, which was nice so that we can communicate with them. Uh, but once she got the balloon, I think, you know, she, she had a smile on one side of her face and the other. So it was, made us all happy. And, you know, this is, this kind of like the last picture is the picture of the, of the border crossing. I'm not sure if, uh, the, the little, the big stuffed animal, not sure if that is P Poland's mascot. Um, <laughs> not sure exactly what it is, but um, it was there greeting uh, family members. But you can kind of see people on their phones talking to folks, um, communicating with either family members or friends. Um, and uh, it, I, I just, you know, I don't want to say this. Uh, there was a couple hundred people that came through this this section. I, just imagine, and I think the first mission, the Ukrainian, the first fly-in, saw thousands of people coming through this this border crossing every like every hour on the hour. Um, it's just it, it was it was quite incredible. But even this was a little bit overwhelming for me. I mean, those are those are those were the pictures there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Michal, for coordinating that. So we've already got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the first uh, two questions. Uh, one question is, how is the aid being coordinated, which has been given through these agencies that are offering assistance? Yeah, I, I, Fred, Fred can share a little bit more insight and Eric, you as well. Um, I'm on the uh, I'm on the allocation subcommittee that's that's being run by there's about I think 20 25 of us around the country. It's being run by David Brown, who is um, the incoming uh, vice chair um, uh, of Jewish Federations of North America. And um, the way it's the as I understand it, the way it's being coordinated is that I mean we've we've raised a little over forty million dollars. Uh, 39 million of which have been advocated or, or, or have been um, allocated, sorry. Um, just like any other um, allocation committee um, in, a, in a federation uh, where there are, there are certain needs that are, that, uh, uh, that are requested and, and, um, and then kind of the, the line item of the dollar amount that's needed and then what, it, what it's needed for everything from food, transportation, and, and whatnot, um, and, and shelter. But Eric and Fred, I think, could, could also provide some in, insights, especially Fred from the, from the Jewish agency's perspective. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Let, let me jump in here a second. Um, yeah, coordination is kind of an interesting word to use here because uh, as the saying goes, what we have is a rapidly evolving and, in a lot of cases, chaotic situation. Um, and one of the things that I have to emphasize is the reason that um, the reason that so much is being done on the ground right now is because so much so much has been done in the in the weeks, months, years, and decades before. Uh, the fact that we have such an infrastructure, as Aaron mentioned, allows us to get on the scene and do all this. Um, Aaron talked about visiting the refugee center, the converted five, four star hotel. Uh, the Jewish agency actually went in early on before, before any of the, 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 uh, the refugees began arriving 
and reserved 6,000 beds because we, because we had, the, we, we, we had the, the foreknowledge that this was going to be an, an incredible humanitarian disaster. So we were up, so the system was on the ground and working before any of this ever happened. Uh, it was not easy. It was not cheap, but it was necessary. So co- coordination, um, like I said, it's a very strange term to use when we're spending the money now and, and trying to raise it later. Um, and it's, this is probably a good point for me to talk about some of the numbers that we're seeing and, and give a little perspective to this. Um, Aaron, I think you mentioned three and a half million refugees having come out of Ukraine. I think that number is over four and a half at this point, possibly close to five, which is somewhere around 12 to 15 percent of the total population of Ukraine. Um, From the Jewish agency's perspective, at this point, we are on the order of 13,000 Olim having arrived in Israel. Uh, that is roughly 50% of the, of the overall Aliyah numbers that we have seen over the past few years. In addition, we have seen 26,000 Ukrainians having come in on tourist visas, uh, a fair number of whom will actually put in for Aliyah. So we don't know what those numbers are going to look like. Additionally, and we're not giving this a whole lot of attention, but it is an issue, um, a lot of the potential Olim that we're seeing are going to be coming from Russia in Moldova and Belarus. Um, this, is, this is going to be a situation with very, very wide spillover effects. So when we're talking about uh, $100 million worth of needs coming up, the number I heard this morning from the, from the head of the Jewish agency, from the chair of the board and the chair of the executive, is that the Jewish agency itself has already invested over $40 million. We've had about $30 million come in. Uh, we are anticipating uh, needs over the next near to midterm of, of around 130 million. And that's just for the Jewish agency. Uh, it doesn't include what the JDC is doing. What, it doesn't include what the JDC may be spending coming down the road. Because one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that one of the great miracles of 20th and 21st century Judaism is the creation of thriving Jewish communities in the shadow of the Shoah. And unfortunately, a lot of that has been, has been wiped out. And the question is, who are, people will want to go back. They're going to want to rebuild their lives. The, uh, others will want to rebuild their lives in Israel. Some will want to be, build lives in, in other communities. We don't know. But there's going to be a lot of rebuilding coming down the pipe. We're, we're in the early stages. Uh, as Churchill once said, we may not be at the beginning of the end, but we may be at the end of the beginning. Um, I think also uh, you have to, in Israel, the Jewish agency is working with, has set up 30 hotels to house, to house immigrants. Um, but we're also taking a more proactive approach. We are reaching out to people in the Ukrainian and Russian communities in Israel that make contact with their relatives and try and be proactive about moving them around. And when it comes to moving people out of Ukraine, uh, this is where the real coordination is. It's on the ground. Uh, there is a whole infrastructure, as Aaron mentioned, that includes the Jewish Agency Shlichim. It includes JDC Hesed Centers. It includes Chabad. It includes the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. This is a team effort to use that network within Ukraine to find people, to help them get out, to, to, to rent buses, to find drivers, uh, to, get, to, to fuel the buses. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly complicated, um, and it takes everybody on hand. But I want everybody in this call to think of one thing. The reason we're able to do it is because of what we as a community have built over the years. And that I have never, like Aaron, I have never been more proud to be part of the federations of the Jewish agency and organized Jewish life as I am right now. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so much. And that's a perfect segue. We have two more questions in the queue for Aaron and they both relate to information Fred was just sharing and to Aaron, your experiences. Uh, we know that you did go on uh, to Israel following your time in Poland and at the Ukraine-Poland border. Um, so the two questions, and I'm going to actually take them in reverse order. Uh, the question is, did you, Aaron, visit the Israeli field hospital when you were in Poland? We, we didn't. Uh, we, uh, we were there for... I would say 24 hours tops. Um, I, I, I think others have, um, but, but I'm, I'm not sure. 
uh, I would definitely want, um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't know for sure. So understood. And as Fred well, out, let, me, let me jump in with a, little, with a little vignette here. Um, as I just put in the chat, I think the field hospital is actually over the border in Ukraine, I think mm. 15 kilometers or so. Uh, and I was talking with uh, Beth Kiefer Leonard, who's chair of the Budget and Finance Committee of the agency uh, earlier this week. And she, she and other leadership, senior leadership of the agency took a quick trip. And she oh, actually awesome. went over the border to the field hospital and talked to some of the doctors there. And they're mostly all Russian, if not Ukrainian speaking. And she told one story that I, that I, I, I kind of want to share. They said they uh, family had come in. Uh, woman, uh, woman and her grown daughter and the grown daughter had been, I want to say being un undergoing chemo, uh, but hadn't been treated in about three or four weeks, uh, if not longer. And, and the doctor said, you know, we got to get her to Israel, but there's no way to get her out. And Beth looked over to Amira, who's the CEO of the agency, Amira. We got to get this person on an Aliyah flight. There's just no way. And the next night, she was in Israel getting treated. So, you know, it, it, like when I, when I say this is a team effort, it's a team effort at every level. Fred, thank you so much for sharing that story. It gave me goosebumps. Um, so now I'm going to circle back to the question for Aaron, which is um, we know that you went on to Israel after your time in Poland and at the Poland Ukraine border. And uh, just to talk a little bit more about your experiences there, uh, what in uh, contact you had with any of the Ukrainian uh, Jews who had made Aliyah or had gotten into Israel, whether on tourist visas or what have you, um, and, and any uh, sort of uh, commentary you can share around that aspect of, of the experience. Yeah, I, so that, that trip uh, to to Israel was, um, it was a study mission uh, that was planned um, longer than a week <laughs> in advance of going. Um, and we had, we, we had pivoted a little bit in terms of our, uh, our programming given Ukraine, uh, but it was, a, it was a cabinet study mission that was designed to see all aspects of um, Israeli culture, diversity, um, and, uh, and so one of the things that we ended up doing as a community, as a cabinet community led by one of our former co-chair, former co-chairs, Rachel Hoffer from Phoenix, um, she and the other seventh years had uh, came up with a, an amazing idea to give Aleem um, gift cards uh, in advance of um, in, when they, when they, when they get to uh, when they get to Israel, you know they have to buy groceries, they have to buy clothing, they have to buy all all sorts of things, um, and so there are there were a number of different ideas. And you know when it came to you know gift cards, do we just get them a, a you know a, a grocery gift card? Do we get them a gift card that goes anywhere? So we ended up getting a kind of a multifaceted uh, gift card. Uh, 500 shekel for, for each family. We ended up raising about $50,000, maybe a little bit more than $50,000 as a cabinet community um, and presented uh, those gift cards, a majority of them um, uh, to, uh, to the Jewish agency, to Amira, uh, when we met with, met with her um, in, um, in Jerusalem. So uh, I think, you know, when, when, when we were traveling from Warsaw to, um, uh, to Israel, to Tel Aviv, we were on a flight with a number of Olim. And um, I, I can tell you that it was, man, I was a little embarrassed to be flying um, business class uh, on that flight. And, you know, I can just be honest about it, that, you know, it was, it was dead quiet um, on the flight. Um, I, uh, I asked the flight attendant um, if, you know, what, what food um, the, uh, you know, everybody on that flight uh, 
was getting and, and uh, even inquired about, you know, little treats for the kids. But there, I mean, there were a number of uh, babies on the flight, not a single peep. Nobody, it was, it was shocking to both me and uh, to some of our, uh, some of our other cabinet members that were with me um, that, uh, that it was dead silent. So I, th that was part of our, you know, the, the, the focus was uh, a little bit different in Israel, um, but I was glad that we got to at least contribute in some way um, physically uh, to, to, to the families. I think we ended up, right, if not, my math is right, I'm a lawyer, so I don't do math very well, um, but uh, probably about 500, we were reaching like four to 500 gift cards. Which is, you know, which is remarkable. And, and thank you, Aaron, and thank you to, uh, to Lindsay, the other members of National Leadership Cabinet from all over uh, North America. It, uh, it is remarkable. Um, and I see uh, Noam, our community shlicha, just put in the chat. Uh, she just had a, Jew, uh, we had a Jewish agency uh, Zoom for Passover and talked about Yolim coming to Israel and how moving uh, it is. And, it, and, and truly uh, all different, parts of the experience that Aaron, as you just described, the uh, experience in Poland, uh, Lublin and uh, at the border and in Israel, all, all of those uh, experiences uh, sounds like had such emotional impact in you know, different places along the way. Um, and that's, um, uh, that's incredible. And we're so grateful for you to share that with us. Um, Let's pause for a second to see if we have other folks who have questions, um, whether people want to take themselves off mute to ask their question, or if people want to drop a question in the chat. Um, happy to hey. take them either way. And Eric, let me let, let, let me just say this um, before we jump to the questions, that those who I've talked to, both Jewish and non-Jewish, are looking for ways to help. Um, and they are looking for organizations that can do the basic things for, uh, for Ukrainians. And um, it's important to note that, you know, we partner with a number of different organizations that um, don't just help uh, Jews, that are helping uh, non-Jews in Ukraine um, that, you know, are providing assistance and sustenance, that there's also, you know, we're not asking. At the end of the day, when people come to, into the border and they need help, we are providing help. We don't ask them whether or not they are, you know, they're of a particular religion. Anyone who comes through the border and asks for help, we are helping. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, the, this briefing and other briefings, what's the most important is those on this call um, and, and, and those who want to do and want to help, um, especially with our resettlement efforts, become active. We have an obligation to encourage others to donate encourage others to um, donate their time um, because there's just going to be a lot of need that uh, that won't go away tomorrow. Just not. Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. And, and picking up on Aaron's uh, last comment relating to uh, refugee resettlement, just to let everybody know. So uh, the United States uh, administration has said that 100,000 uh, Ukrainians will be allowed into the United States and that uh, it is our understanding the priority is going to be based on family reunification. And in fact, yesterday in uh, the Federation e-newsletter that we sent out here in Nashville, there was a link so that people could uh, add a message to the administration to ask the administration to expedite this process so that the family reunification can begin and uh, we are already uh, exploring what it will take here in our local community. We are determining 
uh, how many Ukrainian Jewish families are already here to ascertain uh, how many cases of family reunification there could be. And we are uh, very eager uh, to, to learn all that we can do. And that is in addition to, of course, what, what we've been talking about, which is supporting financially with the effort. And just to put some context to the numbers, uh, and thank you, uh, Jessica, for putting uh, into the chat the link to send a message to the American administration uh, about uh, the family reunification. Um, and I see we have another question in the chat. We'll get to that in one second. I just wanted to give people some context about the numbers that have both been raised and what is needed. So based on what has been raised here in Nashville and among all of our federations that have been channeled through Jewish federations in North America to our overseas partners, uh, Jewish Agency for Israel, JDC, uh, as well as uh, Chabad and, and other Hillel, other groups. So of the approximately $40 million, so the need is still another more than two times that amount. So in other words, if the 40 million that has been uh, collected already, uh, in addition to that, there's going to be a need of up to perhaps 100 million, perhaps more. And so uh, clearly uh, each of our communities, each of our individual federations will need uh, to do more. Um, and to, uh, uh, if you see in the chat, um, uh, Michal was answering Mark's question about highest being involved in resettlement, which they will be. Um, and so we have uh, uh, we have a network uh, that we're we're going to be working together with in this regard, uh, depending on however um, that process unfolds in terms of resettlement for Ukrainians, particularly Ukrainian Jews. Um, so uh, I'll stop for a sec, I'll pause, and again, go back to the question, do we have folks who want to either take themselves off of mute to ask a question or to drop something in the chat to ask a question? Either way, we'd welcome folks who have more questions to share them with us. Okay, all right, seeing those are the questions we have uh, from the group. Uh, I'm just going to um, pose uh, a question uh, myself. Uh, Aaron, uh, you, were, you were on the ground for such a short period of time, uh, and yet your experiences in Poland and at the Poland-Ukraine border clearly made such a tremendous impact on you. Uh, if anybody else has the opportunity to go, if they are asked if they're invited to go for any experience of that nature, would you encourage people to go, uh, even though it does perhaps take away time from folks on the ground there who might be otherwise helping serve the, the refugees? A hundred percent, yes. The, the concern we had, we had talked through that concern, whether or not, you know, the, these missions are either distracting uh, from the work on the ground or are interfering in some way. And I can tell you resoundingly that every person that we talked to wanted us there. They wanted us there to bear witness, to see what's going on, to be able to bring it home so that, that we can uh, galvanize support around all of these different efforts and these organizations. Um, so I, the, the, the answer is yes. And if there is interest in going, um, please let me know, let Eric know, let Fred know, uh, let Andy know um, that it, it's important that, um, that our communities are, are, that our communities actually see um, various different perspectives on the ground. And um, there are some things that, you know, that, that, that others saw that I did not, which which really like it it made my experience that much um, more enriching because I was able to hear their stories of things that you know things that they heard and um, and, and 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 witnessed. Um, it, it gave me a much more fulsome picture because, as you can imagine, on the border, it's just it's a lot of things going on and. You know, it's a little bit of a sensory overload. So um, 
I, I would the 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 short answer is uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much. I I appreciate that. And I also do know that, as you mentioned, some days, some border crossings are busier than others. And part of that does reflect what is happening on the battlefield in Ukraine and how the Ukrainian uh, defense forces are able to respond to the, the Russian aggression, the Russian invasion. And so I think it's it's really important for people to, to appreciate what you said, because another visit another mission could go at the same time and there uh, or there, there could be a much much greater flow or there could be a, a trickle and so it does very much depend on what is happening in ukraine and i think that that is uh, a key point um before we wrap up i know just uh it's really important for everybody uh to keep in mind and we've we dropped it in the chat a couple of times and we'll we'll drop it in once more which is how to give. Everybody has the ability to give something. And I think, uh, thank you, Jessica. I think it's super important for people to appreciate this is above and beyond whatever somebody is giving for the Federation 2022 annual campaign. This is something extra. And I think that hopefully all of us can appreciate given the lives that we lead uh, here in our own country, here in our own community, uh, for most of us here in Nashville, that um, we're very grateful for the lives that we lead and the about the the ability for us to to find something extra. And I think that it's really critical that um, whatever we are giving, that we we find the means to go to give to give more. And uh, and I uh, I really want everybody to appreciate the importance of that and uh, we have provided the link in the chat as you can see. And so we really want to leave people with that message. You can you can give, you can uh, be an advocate. Uh, we also put in the chat about how to communicate with the administration about accelerating the resettlement of the family reunification for these 100,000 Ukrainians who are gonna come to the United States. And, and yes, as, as Aaron talked about, you can give of your time as well. We we definitely need all of that. We need you know, your resources, your time, uh, and your willingness to be to be an advocate. Um, and yes, we, we there's a, a fantastic toolkit. I, I really want to give credit. Uh, Jewish federations in North America have worked uh, tirelessly on behalf of our federations and in partnership with our overseas partners, Jaffe, JDC, and the other. Uh, providers, you know, we really do have the information. We have uh, detailed reports, and, and we're very fortunate to have Aaron in our community, who, as uh, he said, is one of the members of the allocations committee that's determining how the money is being distributed. So we have not only the benefit of his firsthand experience, having been on the ground in Poland at the border, and, and having been in Israel recently, we also have. Uh, Aaron is part of that allocations committee, so we, we have a great deal of assurance that we know who's involved and, and, and how seriously this is being taken care of. So thank you so much to Aaron. Uh, I thank everybody who's with us who took the time to be on today. Uh, unless we have uh, anything else, I think we're, we're all set and we're good to wrap up. Terrific. Thank you all. If we don't see you or talk to you beforehand, I want to wish everybody a happy and healthy Passover, Hag Sameach, and hope uh, for a, a beautiful, wonderful holiday. And thank you all for being here. Thanks, Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.